themselves, but we have a jam-packed panel, um, which I promise you I will not get a word in for. But um, please, Jacqueline, why don't you start? All right, here we go. Uh, Jacqueline Ruel, I'm the VP Head of Brand at Papa John's. I'm probably like a newbie in my role on this panel. I've been in the role for six months. Hi, Brandy Blackwell. I'm Head of Marketing, uh, Vice President for Another Broken Egg Restaurants. We have um, 83 locations across 15 states. Uh, Ashley Travis, some of you probably uh, saw me yesterday um, where I was talking a little bit more about like the digital and technology side, uh, but my background, I started out in pure marketing um, at uh, Starbucks and, and Amazon and Frito-Lay before coming to Yum, so today you'll probably hear me talk more like about marketing and maybe some digital, right. so. I also forgot that they're going to give their favorite menu item. Oh, uh, yeah. We'll come okay. back through. We'll come back. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Laura Ruckel, I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at Freddy's Frozen Custard and Steak Burgers. If you're not familiar with Freddy's, we're up to about 468 locations across 38 states. And um, I will take the favorite menu item question, which if you've never had a double steak burger at Freddy's, you are missing out specifically the California style. I add pickles. You can customize our stuff any way you want, along with an order of cheese curds. They are fantastic. And if I'm really feeling it, a strawberry shake with extra strawberry. I add pickles to everything. So and I then get it. like a wheelchair to get me out of the, of the building. <laughs> so that's mine. Um, so I shared a favorite menu item yesterday, so I'll do my second favorite. Um, and I'm not doing like original recipe, of course, that's a given. Uh, so this is the chitza. And so it is a chicken, like a fried chicken patty. Think of that as the crust of the pizza. And wow. then marinara sauce and you know cheese and pizza toppings. Um, it's yeah. awesome. We've launched it in Latin America and the Caribbean and Canada and South Africa. It's, it's really fun. So I'm obsessed with our shrimp and grits. It's like a staple for us. Um, and just, it's, it's like crack. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> Is anyone else currently starving with all these ideas? Um, mine's going to be, if anybody was here on Friday, I surprised the crowd, but the, our new uh, crispy parm pizza, the deluxe cheese version, it's Parmesan crusted on the bottom. Whoever was here on Friday, Jacqueline ordered pizzas for the entire crowd and stormed Lambert's. Um, so... One of the things that I was really surprised by, by getting to know all the women on this panel, was the extensive purview that you have as brand marketers, CMOs, head of tech, head of products, um, culinary reports to head of marketing when you're in restaurant marketing. It is a complicated role. Um, Ashley has been to six to seven countries in the last year um, and was only home for three days in the last few weeks. It is an intense job. Um, I'd love to just, let's bounce around. Um, maybe Jacqueline, you want to start. Um, pull back the curtain for us and what this is like. Um, so she had a brand like Papa John's, which is one yeah. of the top pizza brands. Um, and I'm still getting used to it. You know, I'm six months in. I came from the agency background, so I was used to like the grit in the grind, I would say. QSR leaves nothing on the table. Like, it's fast, it's frenetic. Um, I like that. I like being able to, like, deal with the speed and kind of go to market at speed. I think it also means we get to produce a lot of things. So, in my world, um, it's really all the content and the way that the brand shows up in the world. So, while, while I have some focus, it's like every single place that you could see our logo, a piece of creative, kind of all falls under me. So I have multiple agency partners. I run an internal creative team. The social team rolls up to me. I'm working with the digital team being better connected because digital is our front door for every single pizza order that's coming in these days. So a lot of my world is just making sure that like we're creating that connectivity across across everything and how our brand's gonna show up no matter which touch point the consumer's gonna come through. Yeah, and um, interestingly enough, I was, uh, I've been in QSR or Fast Casual my entire career, so um, this is the fifth brand I've worked on, but most recently I came over from Digital Ecom with Jimmy John's and prior to that, um, Dunkin Donuts US business, it's just Dunkin now, so let me correct that. Um, so it's been, a, it's been a shift actually into the full service space um, and I do, culinary does report into me and we are so driven by 
culinary and beverage innovation. Um, we don't discount. We're not a value-driven brand. We provide value in, in different ways, um, and that is you know, our food, our service, the occasion, the ambiance. Um, and, and just really indulgence and celebrating connections with each other. Um, so it's a whole different shift in mindset of what, you know, I'm not trying to get somebody around the building in two minutes um, in and out. And um, loyalty becomes a whole different, uh, you know, approach when you're in full service and, and really not offering that deal. So had to kind of shift my mind and thinking there. Yeah, and I think um, I am trying to get people in and out in two minutes. Um, but, <laughs> uh, you know, when you lead marketing at a retail or QSR organization, um, you know, as the ladies here mentioned, you, you're doing a little bit of everything. So, but ultimately, everything needs to ladder up to driving same store sales growth. And that is what you're responsible for. Are we driving same store sales growth? Um, and so you have to ensure that you're very disciplined and ensuring everything that you're doing is going to contribute to the brand, but then also being the voice and the steward of the customer. Um, and in doing that, you're you as as you mentioned, you have your hands in everything. So it's really important to be a well-rounded marketer. Um, and like for me in my career, that's been really important. I started off in like CPG brand marketing on Tostitos, did the Fiesta Bowl and some product innovation. And then I did retail marketing at Starbucks. And then they're like, hey, we need someone to go learn digital. And I was like, I'll do that too. Because like having experiences in all of these different areas actually allow you to have a more holistic view of the business and what levers you can pull to drive that growth. And is it hard to say disciplined? And Laura, I want to get yes. to you, but the discipline, right? Yeah. The discipline to make sure that you're driving sales, to make sure that you're getting butts and seats, as Laura said. Yeah, because you can get sucked down the rabbit hole of like really cool activations yeah. and like over-index your time on things that then you like step back and you look and you're like, oh, what did that drive? Why did yeah. we do that? Yes, yeah, so I'll piggyback onto that to answer that question. I think um, you do have to stay disciplined, and I'm going to guess that that's exactly why every single one of us up here is in our role, because at the end of the day, it's all about prioritization, to your point on same-store sales growth. There are a lot of cool stuff we could go do, and there's a lot of things that we would love to try, and again, whether that's in your role now or previous roles, but at the end of the day, really laddering that up to is it driving traffic and is it driving same store sales? And that is really, really the key. I'll, I'll add on two other additional points um, in these roles that's very interesting. One is the differences in channels. I think probably throughout some of these panels, people have talked about channels in terms of how we think of marketing channels, but on the restaurant side, it's drive-through, it's dine-in, it's delivery, it's third-party delivery, it's first-party delivery, it's pickup, it's mobile. And so we're also balancing those and the roles of different products in those channels and different consumers in those channels and the revenue and the profitability, which leads me to the profitability, the other number one reason that um, in most cases, not in all, but a lot of restaurants are franchise owned and operated. Some of us have company stores, but a lot of us are franchises. And that's a critical, critical element because these are people, for any of you who've ever been around franchising, they have given everything, not just blood, sweat, and tears. I'm talking 401ks, everything, to join and be a part of your brand. And as a brand marketer, it is your responsibility to deliver that to them every single day and help them be profitable and grow. And that's kind of a North Star. I talk about that with my team. You know, at the end of the day, we're here to serve franchisees and help them grow their business in a profitable way. Um, not to mention, I also take their money. Uh, most of us who are in that, it, we're all funded, including our salaries in most cases, um, by, by percentage of sales. And they'll remind you of that on a very frequent basis. <laughs> So, you know, that's another thing, just being able to kind of show those metrics. And I think that's um, part of what makes it really fun. I think at the end of the day, nobody's in this business who's not passionate about it. Um, and so it's just, it's just a, a really nifty, um, it's not something you find in every, in every brand. And so I think that's kind of exciting uh, when you're in restaurant marketing. Yeah, and just to piggyback on that, I think the one thing I learned several years ago when I got into franchise model, you know, franchise model businesses was, um, you know, look at it as a franchisee. We are, we want them to bring 15 cents of every dollar. That's not every business, but particularly most that I've worked in anywhere from that 12 to 18 cents on a dollar. And that 13 cents versus 14 cents 
is a big difference, and it makes a big difference to the bottom line. Um, so that's how we're looking at it. It's not, it's not nickels, it's not dimes, it's not quarters, it's pennies. Um, in order to, to you know, feel like the, the margins are where they're supposed to be for franchisees. Well, it's actually a really great segue into product innovation, right? Because you're working with your franchisees. Um, in some instances, um, depending on the brands on the panel, we're thinking also about global versus um, more geo-targeted restaurants and locations. How are you working with the franchisees to bring ideas to life on the product side? Um, and how much lev like, leverage are you giving them within the framework of the brand to make sure that you're bringing the right products to market? Yeah. I can kick us off here. We, I mean, listen, we always have to listen to our franchisees. You've heard us all up here. They're, they're on the front lines. They're bringing us ideas. But at Papa John's, we have an entire culinary team um, that's kind of built to look deeper at those insights, look at the category, look at what's coming, look at what's new. And they're really driving a lot of the insight around the, the product that we're going to bring. So, like, example, the current pizza that we have on right now, the crispy parm, you know, that team thought about Everybody has cheese on top of their pizza. Some of us have stuffed it under the crust. Like, where's the next place cheese can go? <laughs> we'll put it on the bottom. No, there was much more insight into that. But you know what I'm saying? Like, I think a lot of it is coming out of, we've got rich insights and an awesome culinary team that's looking out years down the road, like, what's going to be that new thing we can bring to market? And then I think what excites the franchisees is the fact that we are constantly pumping innovation into the marketplace. Like, if we don't have, like, a new pizza coming, they're like, where's the new pizza? So, right. So I think it's, like, starts with us, but then validated once it goes out into the and market. I'd echo that in terms of very similar model. Ultimately, we use them to make sure it's operationally going to work. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, we, we, they are looking to us as yeah. insights drivers, understanding what the consumer is looking for, taking the brand further than maybe they would have thought. That franchisees get very comfortable in kind of the way they do the way they do. But ultimately, a great idea is only as good as it can be operationally executed and potentially, you know, being able to put together and out the door in three minutes. So that's, that's really the ultimate piece that on our side where we leverage them. And then to take that a step further, how many SKUs are you bringing in? Oh, yes. yes. Right? Um, is, it, are we, is it one, two, three? Yeah. Are you making it on saute side or grill side? That's yeah. a problem I've learned about um, recently. And I can't even cook a fried egg, so not, not a good example of, of one, making those decisions. And then also penny profit. So, the, you know, we have to balance the penny profit. So, okay, we'll, we'll bring a couple more SKUs in if penny profit is there, seafood, you know. Um, so we're all, for, you know, it's a $20 meal, but you're taking more to the bottom line. So you're going to take a little bit more um, frustration in the kitchen, perhaps, for that, for that sale. Yeah, the way I think it would be helpful for those that haven't worked in a franchise business, the way that they're structured, um, and I'm generalizing, but the way that they're structured is that the franchisees are operators, usually. Like, they're in charge of running that restaurant, and they pay a percentage of their sales into a restaurant support center to actually do all of the marketing, all of the media planning. Uh, but then we have committees. So then the franchisees sit on an ADCO board, or sometimes there's a product innovation board, or a digital and technology board. And so um, as stewards of the brand, we actually have to go to that board and get things approved by them um, how, of how we're spending their money uh, to make sure they're aligned in, in how we're going to grow their business. Incredible. And we talked about tech a little bit, right? So tech and our CRM data is driving a lot of these product decisions. And I still can't believe that culinary reports to marketing. It makes so much sense, but like it blew my mind. Um, <laughs> I don't want to get too far down the tech rabbit hole, but I do want to ask Ashley, because you actually straddle both of these roles, and I think everyone really does at the end of the day. Um, how, you know, how does the data inform the products, right, to, to, for release? Um, and how does that affect you globally? Because KFC is such a large global brand. Yeah, I mean, I think, so we have um, just recently, you'd be shocked to probably learn that just recently we centralized all of our transaction level data from every market from around the world. And what that allows us to do is develop really amazing insights on where customers, what cu customers are consuming, why they're consuming it, when they're consuming it. And because we were able to take the landscape and look at it from all markets, it actually gives us really great insights on where, um, where we have like white space opportunities. We call them category use occasions 
occasions of like where um, one market might be doing really great with our you know chicken burgers at lunchtime and another market over indexes on buckets at dinner time and then we see hey like but let's actually share those learnings across these markets and bring product innovation from one country to another to help them grow more use occasions therefore you know driving more transactions I was just going to say a centralized you know, data warehouse is something we all have been striving for. And I would say it doesn't matter if you're small or large. Um, we rely on you know, POS data. We rely on consumer insights. We rely on all of this. But how does it live in one centralized place and, and to really be actionable? And that is something that I think we've all just recently either started, finished, you know, got closer. But then you've got to mine the data. And you've got to constantly clean the data and look at the privacy laws, you know? So having a true like CRM platform or CDP platform where all this data can come in and then go out to the necessary stakeholders, supply chain, um, IT, but it's all in one platform where, you know, the customer data is not disjointed is critical to everything that we do for output. And so I think it's just important to, to make sure it starts there because if you can't trust the data, your argument's pretty much, you know, null and void anyways. It's actually nice to hear that you guys are saying you're just getting there because some of, you know, Papa John's was a former founder led brand. And so you come in and sometimes you're like, oh, I'm really surprised they don't have that set up already, right? Ditto. Um, and sometimes it puts us in a little bit of a startup mode, but like, and that feels cool because you're like, oh, I get to put my hands on it and we're going to build it together. But it's a little bit of a breath of fresh air because sometimes I'm sitting there and I'm like, what do you mean we don't have the data for that? Or like, what do you mean it's not set up yet? So, but it's, it's good to hear we're all in it together, ladies. I also, the marketplace is changing so quickly. Um, and I think yeah. it's so interesting how everyone's actually internalizing a lot of the struggles. Um, yeah that are actually really universal at this point. And I think tech and CRM is one of them. Randy and I talked a lot about that on our prep call. Um, oh, no, I was going to say, try coming from Amazon and to, into <laughs> QSR. I was like, what the hell? How did, like, how does chicken actually get to the people? Um, so it, that first year was like really challenging because I was like yeah. so used to like the best in class like uh, commerce and data capabilities. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay. You made it. <laughs> okay, let's take a shift for a minute into brand love. And I know that's something that Jacqueline's really, really um, wanted to chat about. But the idea that um, on this panel, we are literally trying to sell the most competitive products in market, right? We have burgers, we have pizza. Um, QSR is a very competitive field. Um, how are you getting brands, A, to either choose you, I'm hungry and I want to go to Freddy's versus a, another brand that's yep. competitive in your market, um, or how do I find that affinity where they, they feel that brand love, they really want to wrap their arms around you as a brand? Um, and I would love to hear from everyone because I think it's... It's this I'll sort of universal it. question. Yeah, I mean, I think this is the this is a great thing all marketers are chasing, regardless of whether you're in a restaurant or not, right? I mean, brand love is is the, everything that we want. I think in our situations, we're probably all in a little bit of a different phase. Um, just to speak to Freddie specifically, I'm sitting in a very unique spot in that we're really, I, I would say, probably on the cusp of becoming a regional of a, of a regional brand that's really on its way to being. Um, a truly national player. What's interesting is when you ask our our consumers and our guests, you know, they'll put us up against you know the Chick Fil A's, the McDonald's, the um, some of our other competitors, the Shake Shacks of the world. Um, but at the end of the day, we are also not really that aware. We only really our brand awareness is not nearly as high as you might think. And a lot of that is just because we aren't really dense in as many markets as we are today. So to answer kind of your ultimate question around brand love, it's a, it, it's ultimately it's really really important that you keep the the pedal on a long term. I am passionate about long term brand awareness and brand love, and it's really hard when you're also up against you know performance marketing and you report to a private equity firm and you're you know you've really got to show those numbers and the metrics and the ROI on that but at the end of the day you also still need to be developing the brand for the long for the long haul and and so it's it's a balancing act and i think we're all probably doing that in various ways um, but I'm a, I'm a firm believer in, in you got to straddle both. Yeah, and I just want to build on that because I think that is really important. Of um, 
we get tired of our own stuff before customers ever even remember it. <laughs> and so we had like playing the long game is really important. And we think about brand love in like two categories. One, we need to drive crave and through our taste. We need to show people eating the food. We need to show like the cheese gooing off of things. Like we need to have that crave, but then we also need to be culturally relevant. And so one a great example, um, in Australia, we have this campaign that we've been doing now for, I think, six years. Same campaign for six years. Um, and it's called Does Someone Say KFC? And it really is just like these small cultural like, uh, uh, moments when uh, you're in a really awkward situation. And then uh, like you distract the person by saying, like, because the crave kind of comes in or like, a, a, like an image of our food drives by on a billboard, on a bus or something. And they're like, does someone say KFC? to like get out of a really awkward situation. And, but it allows us, the flexibility of that campaign allows us to be culturally relevant every year because we can um, create these, it's almost templatized, so we can create these moments, these awkward moments based on what's going on in society at that particular moment and capitalize on that. But now like you are in Australia and you're in an awkward situation and someone will go, does someone say KFC? And it just, it's become part of society now. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to, I think about it a little differently, um, but two things is, you know, I was on a call, um, the industry call the other day, and something stuck out, stood out to me is, he's, a, a gentleman said, you need to be the most loved and best in your category. So, so that may be today that I'm working from home and I want something fast, um, I can go, you know, but I, I want something decently healthy I feel good about, right? And that may be, I don't know, let's start out there, Chipotle moment for me. But then I want to go to brunch is another broken egg the first place I think of. And that's, and, and is that my go-to for brunch? So being the best in your space for owning what, you know, your category is. And then I think also value. Value means so many different things to people. And what is your unique selling point? What is your value proposition? It could be that you're indulgent and you get a lot of food for your money. It could be that we have a full bar and a lot of unique alcohol offerings that some of our competitors don't. But it's, you know, to, that value prop, to, it means something to somebody, you know, and it's not the cheapest, it's not, you know, the healthiest. Um, in fact, sometimes it's never the healthiest. Um, so just figuring out what that is and really like hanging your hat on that, I think is really critical to driving sales. I'll bring us home. Um, I love brand love everything. It's kind of like what I've built my, my career on. But I think what we all struggle with up here is you want to be able to push those big brand awareness moments. You want to hook into culture. You want to hijack the next thing coming. But to the point we made when we started, it's like you got to also look at everybody internally and be like, and here's how it's going to maybe drive a sale today. <laughs> Because listen, it's, it's not always going to drive a sale in that moment, but we need the long tail effect of when they're ready to order the pizza, the chicken, the brunch, the burger, like we're there, right? And we're front of mind. So I like similar to, to Ashley, I'm like, we're cut from the same cloth. Like we're looking for the crave, but we're looking for those cultural deposit moments. And, you know, we have someone like Shaquille O'Neal, who is a cultural icon, and I think being a brand that has someone to latch on to that helps us catapult into culture so often and kind of leveraging the platform that he brings to us has been a really important part of my role when I, when I started to like, how can we squeeze that partnership? His fandom is so insanely rabid for him, but also like for everything he touches, people are so in love with him, they love what he touches, right? And so Everyone I Everyone associates the pepperoni now with Shaquille O'Neal. Yeah, the shakaroni. But yeah, I think it's important to look within the ecosystem and like to the point of finding brand affinities, it's like, I don't know, maybe KFC and I should make a pizza one day, but... I don't think Pizza Hut would like that very <laughs> yeah. much, but... Uh, it might not go over so But, you know, it's like finding those those places where you can tug on and a partnership be, like, really mad right and, and use that to the best of your ability as well. So, so cultural moments, right? That's a, that's a really hard thing to yeah. navigate because we are in this world where we need to be really agile, right? Someone eats 
someone, you know, the Kardashians order a bucket of chicken. It's like, oh my God, we have to capitalize that on that. Or Shaq wants to shoot a, you know, something in Freddy's. How do you make that decision in that moment when you are trying to manage revenue, you're trying to manage butts and seats and app downloads? When does that cultural moment, that moment of agility come into play for you? Well, you just have to, you have to experiment. You have to be yeah. willing to try and see what works. And if it works, then next time, you know, you can put a little bit more like money and resources behind it. But I mean, you know, we had, uh, there's been a lot of moments where like when um, Kim and Kanye like came into KFC, um, they just like walked into a store and like, we're like, everyone was like taking pictures um, and it just like went crazy. Or, you know, in the UK, um, Prince William was walking by during an interview to all of his security and he came in front of a KFC and just stopped. And he like looked in and he like asked his security if there was time to like go in and order food because he loves KFC. Um, and if you've ever seen like the Princess Diana movie with, Stuart, uh, with Kristen Stewart, like the very end, she takes the boys through the drive through at KFC and that was part of their, um, you know, their upbringing. And so I think you just have to find those moments and then you're like, you post about it or you like take advantage of it. Um, and if it goes well, then you can replicate that on the next moment and even put more energy behind it. And you have to find ways to track it into sales too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'll flip Shack that. Shaq offers just... an offer to everybody, right? Like that's, you know. I'll flip that just a little bit, being a smaller brand with a little less funding. Um, yes, you, you know, we know that there's stuff we can engage with socially, but I think ultimately, like in our brand's case, it's everyday moments, it's quiet moments. Freddie's very much about a brand, you know, it's baseball after school, it's, you know, your kid got the A and you wanna take him, treat him to Freddie's, you know. So we actually are the reverse of these two and play on some of those smaller, we use a lot of micro influencers and a lot of UGC content in that way. Um, and so, you know, that's a lot of our messaging in general is around more the, you know, you don't, you don't need to, it doesn't have to be a big splash. You can just kind of, you know, you can engage with our brand and whatever, you know, moment you would like. So it's, it's a little bit of a flip, but it's, 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 I hate to say it, it's kind of what you got to do when you're smaller and scrappy. Um, and so, you know. I also think this is obvious, but you, every time you come to these conferences, it's like data, data, data. But <laughs> it's like, look at what your customers are interested in. Like, if your customers are not playing in the metaverse, don't go do a thing in the metaverse, right? right. Like, exactly. If they're, <laughs> thank you. It just makes sense, right? Or if you figure out that they're big gamers, then like, yes, it's time to dip your toe in the game or whatever it may be. I think it's over-indexing on that customer data and becoming like maniacal and obsessed and whatever they are about that's where they are when you're not reaching them. So, like, go play where they are. Yeah. And, go find them. And do yeah. make sure that you're doing it authentically. Yeah. Like, whatever you experiment with and go into, make sure you're doing it authentically or else it's going to fall flat. And, like, yeah. you has to be a part of your who your brand is because the minute you try to be someone you're not from a brand standpoint because you're like, oh, we should play in the metaverse, but you're, like, there's no reason for you to be there, that, right. then you're dead in the water. Yeah, I, I mean, authenticity comes up so often. Um, we live in a complicated world, and I think if you can't find, especially your next-gen consumer, um, in an authentic way that actually feels like you're playing to your strengths and their strengths, it, get, it gets complicated. Um, all right, we have 10 minutes left. I want to open up to questions, but first I'm going to ask one more takeaway, um, and we're gonna, we can do rapid fire, but um, you have four amazing women up here who run incredible brands, and look out for Laura, because Freddy's is growing fast. Super fast. Yeah, baby. Um, yeah. What is one thing you need help with, right? You have this room of like, you have publishers, you have salespeople, everyone here is like, wants to just like hanging on every word. What is one thing, and we'll start with Laura, that you feel that you could use help with or something that just is like, you can't manage right now? <laughs> Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that with a question that I think all of us have, but um, I, I need this inflation thing to really, <laughs> really take a back seat because at the end of the day, less discretionary income impacts the restaurant industry significantly. So uh, that is really, so if any of you guys could just like, I do appreciate the lower gas prices this year than last year, this time last year. We had a war and five dollar ish gas, so that's that's been. Nice. We'll get on that. It's been better, but anyway, I mean, honestly, that's 
That's the truth. The it's just we need more. Yeah, it's change. macros. Yeah. It's really, really macros. <laughs> yeah, I mean, similarly, the supply chain. I need more chicken. Yeah. We have, we've run out of chicken. Chain. We That'd ran out of chicken in chip. Malaysia for like six months. We didn't even yeah, know chicken. Out of fish what does right KFC now? do without chicken? Huh? What do you do without chicken? Uh, well, some of our clo- stores just closed down, uh, but then we, like, it was crazy. Like, they're calling us. They're like, can we sh- sell fish burgers? Can we do And we're yeah, like, no, we're a fried chicken. It's like, it's really, Maybe really hard. Maybe that's why Arby's did the Wagyu burger, because they just couldn't get any more roast yeah. beef. We don't Might know. be. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, supply chain issues are, like, serious. Like, in one, in one country, we ran out of lettuce, so they replaced the lettuce with cabbage, because, like, hey, why not? No. I mean, riots in the streets, like, so, yeah, these supply chain issues, like, really need yeah, to we were actually going to do fat. lettuce wraps in January, and three weeks before, prices went up, it, no supply. Just kidding. We no weren't going to do that. It was strategic. It was strategic. How about eggs and bird flu? Oh, yeah. Eggs are so expensive right now. When, when it's in eggs. your name, it's a little challenging. Um, I but I would say labor is one of the biggest ones. I mean, you know, we're not really talking marketing. I think we're always looking for the next big thing with, like, digital. And it's a, it's a you know, loaded answer there, but... Um, are we spending our money in the right spaces? I just had this conversation with several people in the audience um, earlier. It's like, are we, we think we are, and agencies advise us to, but you know, we're not SMEs in everything that we do. So continuing to know, yeah, we want to be cutting edge, but we need like stuff to work and we need to show conversions. And so, uh, you know, I always say, don't bring me a million billion impressions. I don't care unless you can show me a sale. And that's what I'm being tasked with. That's what all these ladies are being tasked with by our PE okay. groups and by our leaders. Um, so sales and traffic, that's what I need to do is to show me stuff that, that, that delivers on that um, and isn't guesses. Yeah, transactions, transactions, da-da, transactions. Da-da, 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 so we need da-da, everyone da-da. to eat more pizza, brunch, <laughs> chicken, and burgers. And then finish it with some frozen custard. And tell Absolutely. us how much you love us too, apparently. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you guys. I'm Ryan. I'm really glad I eat before this started as well. Um, all right, so question here. You, you talked about two things that are, have a dichotomy. The first is innovation, and the second is franchisees. So innovation and franchisees have a lot of conflict with each other. How do you navigate when you as a marketer know and feel it's the right thing to push your brand into a different space or do something different or to chase something digital It's different? Um, but you know there's a tremendous amount of franchisees who are going to have a tremendous amount of resistance because it's not what they normally know. They're not seeing their ad during college football, et cetera. I can, I can take that. I can take that one a little bit because I worked at, when I was at Dunkin', we were 100% franchise. So there was a vote to vote to vote to vote to vote. And it causes a delay. And there's reasons that other brands were able to move further at certain times. Now, what I will say is that I learned to take franchisees along the journey very early on. So I made really good friends with them, especially the ones that didn't like me or like me that much. And then I also showed them the profit on everything down to that 15 cents, what they're going to take to that bottom line. And I showed them, I went in and, and demoed and I, and I was hands-on in that whole process. And I let them test. I let the naysayers test with me first. I even paid for them to test most of the time, you know, so I could, so I could have them be my brand voice and my advocate for the system, and I leverage some of the, those influential franchisees who, who talk. I leverage those people as not only my friends, but my testers, my guinea pigs, and Your you advocates. Know, my advocates. Yeah. And I would just say 1,000% what she said. Yeah. You have to have a data-driven argument, one. and you pilot how you get the data to make that argument, is you pilot it um, and prove out that business case. And the franchisees are super smart. I mean, like, they, if you give them a data-driven argument and you show that what it's going to do to their bottom line, there's no, you give them no reason not to do it. Absolutely. There's some things you just honestly have to say, I'm sorry, I, this, is, this is just, we need to do it because it's, the system's going to, you know, is duct taped together from like 40 years ago and we just need to do it. And those are the conversations that really are terrible to have, but usually you've gotten to the breaking point that it's non-negotiable anyways, so. I lost questions. No one else? Anyone else? Right here. Hi, thank, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name's Julie, I work for Kraft Heinz, the Heinz ketchup company, so we awesome. work at least with a couple of my you. My kids love you. <laughs> we have a lot of really great brands. Um, yeah, I'll take credit for all of them. Um, one of the things that we're seeing in the retail space is a lot of restaurant brands entering. You're seeing Chick-fil-A sauce, all of these restaurants kind of um, using it as a way to improve brand awareness, brand love, um, and I think it's a trend that's kind 
kind of come from COVID too, of um, how to get that experience at home. So as you t talk about generating those same store sales and prioritization, um, I was just curious how, one, you feel about the trend, and two, if that's a strategy that you guys are, um, yes. girls are implementing. Well, yes. and, I, and I'm like, I'm like, this is a Julie's great Julie's the perfect compliment to this yeah. panel. Um, <laughs> So it's, it's, it's really interesting. You're right. Um, and, and, and as an example, we sell our fry sauce and seasoning right now in a few of, like, we are in some Dillard's and some Kroger um, banners and those sorts of things. Um, typically, typically, and you guys could disagree with me, even though it does do what you're saying from a brand standpoint, it don't make a lot of money. And so it's very challenging sometimes as a franchisor to spend a lot of the effort and stuff. A lot of that stuff's done through third-party brokers and, you know, to really spend a lot of the effort when you know ultimately your your big profit drivers are in your direct um, your direct channel, so that's one. The other two thing is it also can create some franchisee conflicts because then depending on what you're selling, well, wait a minute, why am I going to go buy a pizza in the frozen aisle when yeah. I really want to be sending pizzas to my you know location? Yeah. So I think that's the challenge that you see. But agreed, I mean some brands are really able to lean in on it. Um, so it's it's a topic of debate in yeah. my world. Yeah, I mean, it is, um, I think there, it's only worth doing if you have a differentiated product to sell. Like, so we don't, um, up until, I mean, we're testing some new sauces here in the U.S. right now, but our uh, garlic aioli over in Romania is like, people are obsessed with it. And so it was almost like we have to sell this in stores because they're hoarding the packets in our, like we're running out in our like stores because people are like hoarding. Yeah. So, um, you know, there is, if you have something differentiated to sell, then it's worth, and you're not going to make a lot of money off of it to, to her point, but it drives awareness, it drives buzz, and it drives new customers um, to, to try the brand and to come to the brand. Um, and so you have to do it with a purpose and an objective. Yeah, I would say um, our garlic sauce bottled up in your home, like, I'm trying to do that. Are you kidding? Um, but I would also say, you know, we look at that too, like brand buzz, all the things, but we also look like, is it something we could give to our loyalty members? Is it something a little special that could drive more people to come in the door through Papa Rewards? And so are those some little unique touch points that again, like the lady said, they're not gonna drive profit, but they're gonna drive some of that brand loyalty. It's a little extra special plus up in the journey. So we think about it that way. And I think for, for you, I would use like the advantage you have in terms of all of the manufacturing and try and yes. partner with some of those yes. brands to make it more affordable for yeah. them to execute. Use your because like the brands don't wanna <laughs> make money off of it, right? But you can make money off of it by selling your services and your packaging capabilities. She does free consulting. <laughs> there may be some Heinz in our price. <laughs> Possibly. I think we're going to get kicked off soon. Yeah. yeah. We're done. But that was the first time we've ever just cut a deal between QSR yeah. and Too late. Yeah. See you downstairs by the step and repeat. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. It's amazing. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys. Nice work.